everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and this is going to be the start of the playthrough for Final Girl. If you didn't check out the solo setup video, I definitely recommend that you do, so you get a better understanding of how all this came to be on the table. So without further ado, we're going to dive right into the introduction to the game, and then we're going to talk quickly about our character, the killer we're going up against, the location we're going up against, and then we're going to dive right into it. Something's happening. Someone is dead, and every Everyone is panicking. You try to find something, anything, to use as a weapon. A scared teenager is nearby and pleads with you to help them escape. Then suddenly you hear a noise. Someone is definitely here. You look around trying to see who or what is there, but it's so dark. In a flash, the killer appears and decapitates the teenager whose wide-eyed head rolls and stops at your feet. The killer points at you without saying a word and then turns to another victim. You run the other way. Escape is the only thing on your mind. That and the screams you can't ignore. More victims. There is death and carnage all around. And only then do you realize that there is only one way you will survive. Kill or be killed. Everyone else is dead. You are the final girl. So as you heard in the intro, we have a killer on the loose with no remorse for what he does. And even worse, the more killing he does, the stronger he's going to get. So as you can see, Hans has 12 total hearts here, 11 regular, and then the one final heart, which of course is potentially going to maybe throw a wrench into our plans. And we'll see what happens if we get a chance to get Hans down to that level. As you can tell from the intro of the game, we have no other option. The objective of the game is to kill Hans, because if we don't kill Hans, he's going to kill us. So it's kill or be killed as mentioned. Now we've got victims all over the location board. And these victims are going to be the target of Hans along with the final girl. You'll see how that works when we move through terror cards. But essentially we have victims who are none the wiser or at least think they're safe by moving to other parts of this camping area. Unbeknownst to them, the killer is still moving around and still going to be going after victims to kill them. The worst part of this is the more victims he kills, the more his bloodlust goes up. Now, as Hans goes through Camp Happy Trails, finds those victims, slices them up and takes them down, his bloodlust is going to increase on this meter right here on the far right. That is going to change his original stats that we start at, which is two damage or two hearts worth of damage for his attack and one movement where he starts at the very top row. As his bloodlust is going down, you'll see these stats are going to start changing or it's going to impact the horror track, which is another track that also lets us know how many dice we're able to roll. Of course, the more horror that we actually have to deal with, the less dice we have to roll, which means we don't have as many options because we're so stressed out. Now, as you continue down this track, things get progressively worse in terms of the amount of damage and the speed at which he is moving because he's really having a good time by that particular point. Things get really, really bad if he reaches the very bottom of this track, and he also will start bouncing around at the bottom, enabling him to actually receive health and discard the next terror card. Now, if that wasn't enough fun for you, there's also something here that you can see is a dark power. When he hits this position on the track, he's gonna not only have his stats increase to these numbers, but also a dark power will come. That is linked right here to this bottom half card, which will flip over, and of course, that's gonna increase his ability to inflict pain on likely victims that he's trying to go after or even the final girl or both and then above that we have the finale card which is his final card and that will also flip at a certain interval within the game which we'll talk about once we hit gameplay but that essentially is Hans in a nutshell he is really just trying his best to slice up as many victims as possible while our goal is going to be trying to get those victims away from him while also trying to actually attack him it's an interesting and delicate balance of trying to prevent him from becoming stronger, but also not waste so much time preventing him from becoming stronger that we don't focus on actually killing him. The board directly underneath the killer board is the player board. Of course, this relates specifically to Selena, and this is where we're going to be housing the major mechanisms within the game that are going to let us know how much resource we have in terms of time, as well as how the horror track is doing, which is impacting the dice we're rolling. So let's go over a number of different things happening on this board. You'll also see it during the playthrough. But first off, 
health. Of course, by choosing Selena, six health. We've set this up already. Five regular, one final heart rate there. That'll be the wild card if we get down to it to see whether she actually stands back up after taking that last hit or whether she's down for the count. There's also six victim spaces on her card. So basically, when she saves victims by moving them to one of the three exits on Camp Happy Trail's location board, she's able to move those victims, if she saved them, to one of these slots and essentially gains the benefit immediately, whether it be gained back time, she can move additional spaces, search action cards, or even gain or add terror cards into the terror deck. This board is also going to house things she's picked up. So things she's searched for at locations are gonna sit over here. What's currently in her hands versus what's in her backpack or any allies she has. There's also two major tracks here. One is the time track. It's the major currency of the game. You'll be using this not only to figure out how much time you have left to spend in terms of your current turn, but also how much you have to spend on cards you'd like to add into your hand during that particular phase. You'll see how that works later on. There's an interesting balance between what you spend versus what you spend later to acquire cards. So you can heavily go into one or the other, but sometimes you need to balance between the two. More on that later on. This right here is the horror track. It's really important because as you roll dice in the game, your chances to actually get successes on dice are very important because if you don't get them, you're burning cards in order to try to turn them into successes or you're taking the result of failures, which is not so good. As the horror rating goes up from Han's killer track, or I should say his bloodlust track, you can see examples of this right here. This is going to tick up. And as it ticks up, it's eventually gonna to get to a section of the board where your die is gonna be the only thing you're rolling. But if you hopefully can do it, you'll have cards that will actually bring you back into other portions of this track, which allow you to roll either the same amount of dice you had from the beginning of the game or three dice, which is the best case scenario. For Hans, he starts with a face mask of four, meaning a horror value of four. That's shown right on the killer board in the top left-hand corner next to the health. So that means the horror track level should start right here. So thankfully we get two dice to start with. Starting with one would not be good. You've also got the full rundown of all the different uh, phases in the game. Action phase, spend phase, killer phase, and upkeep phase. You'll see all these as we go through them. So let's focus on some of the different items that we know are currently sitting at certain locations. So right now at the cabins, there is a whistle based on the setup. It says you may use the whistle once per action phase for time, for spending one time. When used, all victims adjacent to the final girl will move to her space. It's like she's calling everyone towards her. Then the killer is going to move towards the final girl, which is quite fun. As long as you have the whistle, one additional victim will follow you. You normally can only have two victims following you at any given time. This whistle will allow you to bring another person with you, but it's also attracting attention of the killer at the same time. At the dock, we have a first aid kit. It states every time you use an action card to successfully heal, you may heal an additional heart. That's pretty awesome. The one right beside it is obviously a knife. And this knife, as noted on the card, states it's a one-handed weapon with the one-hand icon. Of course, you can have something in both single hands or one item that takes up both hands, but beyond that, you only have two hands. The next couple things on that card, one states the range. Of course, with a knife, you have to be in the same space. You can't knife somebody that's in an adjacent space. And secondly, the blast area shows how many, how or how much damage actually will be applied to the victim in addition to whatever you already have damage-wise. So the knife is certainly gonna help out in close combat situations. Something else certainly worth mentioning is the secret tunnel. The utility shed and the cabin are adjacent to one another right now. Only one victim can follow you through this tunnel because remember, normally two can, unless of course you got the whistle. So only one, regardless of anything else of any items or abilities, even states that on the card, the killer cannot use the tunnel. So this is a great way to pop yourself to the opposite side of the map and not have to burn a lot of movement. But the downside is it's only between two different spaces, the utility shed and the cabins. 
The good news is that the cabin's very close to the killer right now. Uh, the bad news is that if I wanted to hop over there, I'd be right next to him. And last but not least, in terms of revealed items to go over, we have the tableau. This is a tableau worth of cards that you'll be purchasing from and exchanging cards between at any given time during the playthrough. What's going to happen in this setup is that all the cards across the top here are only one of each, but they are the most expensive. As you can see in the bottom right hand corner, the time symbol or the hourglass symbol states three all the way up to six. Down at the very bottom here, we have one all the way down to three, and there's two of each of these cards because they're more common. The last thing that I want to mention in regards to the tableau that I think is worth mentioning at this point, although you'll see it in action later on, and you need to understand this because otherwise you'll wonder where my cards have gone once I've discarded them. There is an interesting situation going on here with the tableau. So basically a current round of play is an action phase where you're playing action cards and discarding them coming from your hand. I've got six cards just off camera down here. We'll talk about them in a second. Those ones are free. In the bottom right hand corner, there's just a zero, meaning that they don't cost anything to have them so whenever they're available in the tableau you can literally just take them however after the action phase and after you've burned a number of cards and they're all sitting in your discard pile and you're done you're going to move into what's called a spend phase where you go to the tableau which is this pile of cards right here and you purchase cards based on however much time you have left over which is an interesting mechanic and balance the only thing you have to remember with this is that the cards you just discarded from the action phase do not go into the tableau for that upcoming spend phase. In other words, you're going to have to plan one turn further in advance. So the cards you just used, so for instance, if I have my starting hand here, of six free cards, all of these, and I burnt them all in the action phase right now, they would all sit in my discard. Then the spend phase comes up and I purchase cards. I cannot take those free cards. They will sit there until the next spend phase when they'll be in the tableau to pick up at that point. So seeing as we touched on my starting hand, the fact that they're all free and I get to use them from the beginning of the game, we should probably take a look at those cards. I have a weak attack, which I don't think I'll be using right away because I'm nowhere near them unless of course I somehow get to the utility shed and jump across the entire map. Short rest is something I probably won't be doing either, basically because I'm not damaged yet. Famous last words. Walk is another card. We have actually two walks, so we can actually get where we need to go. And then we've got focus, and focus is really good for controlling the horror track. It's kind of like a calming way to basically just focus on the current situation, not get stressed out, and reduce your horror level if you have successful rolls. Quickly, I'll talk about this, and then we'll, you'll see it in action in the playthrough, but essentially we have dice. As you saw on the horror track, I'm in the fourth position, so it means I get to roll two dice. These dice have blanks on the one and two position, on the three position, and the four position, if I can find it here. I'm rotating it to all the wrong sides. Three and four have cards, which mean if I want to convert this to a success, I have to discard two cards from my hand. That's pretty rough. And then, of course, five and six are where good things happen. If you see five and six, you're hitting the success window, and that's what you want to see. And based on however many successes you get, you basically confirm or just double check against these stars right here, and that's which row you go ahead and do. So if I wanted to focus and I roll this, two successes means I reduce the horror track by one. That's great, getting us closer to eventually getting three dice. Plus, I gain two time. That's the best case scenario. If I only got one success on my roll and I rolled a blank or I rolled this and I didn't want to discard two cards I would only get the middle row and that says to reduce the horror limit by one or horror level by one which is nice but I lose a time that's not good and then this one down here is a straight up fail I basically just didn't want to burn cards or I rolled flat blanks which is no good and that has me losing two time means I really really did a bad job at trying to focus and calm down the rest of the game will be shown as we go through so without further ado let's go ahead and begin the very first round starting with the action phase and play our action cards so the very first thing I'm going to do is one thing to note, of course, that I didn't mention just earlier on here in the overview is the fact that this token right here represents all of those victims, meaning that there's literally six of them here at the fire pit. We do have, as part of the setup, the bonfire card, which means we just have a lot of victims sitting around the bonfire and they're very clueless that the killer is unleashing a lot of pain everywhere. So if the killer gets into that area, he's going to have a field day with all of the victims around him. So we'd like to try to get them 
out of there, remembering the fact I can only bring two at a time, so that becomes quite a struggle. The other thing too is I wanna be prepared for when I run into the killer, so I don't wanna run into a situation I can't handle either. So knowing that we have a secret tunnel between the utility shed and the cabins, plus the ability to go to a utility shed that actually has a knife, that seems like a really logical thing to do. So what we're gonna to do to start off is see whether we can walk our way over there. Of course, the dice may not be in my favor, but you can mitigate it by discarding cards if you happen to get the three or the four side. Now these dice are prototype, so they will definitely change. So first off here, we'll go for a walk. So we're gonna play this card as the very first card I play. And I'm gonna go ahead and roll based on where I'm at in the horror track here for two dice. And we're gonna hope for some successes. Okay, so that was not a great walk. I was very, very slow, tripped up, didn't really make much progress. Now I could go ahead and burn two cards to convert one of these to a success. If I do so, at least I can move one position. I really don't want to burn two cards, but I think I'm gonna do it. And I really, really don't want to, but I'm gonna do it, because this will just show you guys how that works. So essentially these two cards right here, I'm going to burn, because I'm not planning on short resting or doing any attacks in the near future. So that is gonna convert this one to a success. I won't be doing that every single time I do it in terms of actually rotating the die, but just visually so you guys can see, we got one success, which allows me to move up to one space. So I'm gonna go ahead and of course you have to move to a space that's actually adjacent. So this one right here has a line going to this space. I can't go from here to the lake. I can go from here to here or here to here. So I'm happy to go here as we're heading towards the utility shed over here, which is an area that has an icon for a search option. So we have currently burnt three cards of my six already. And all we did was walk one space. That was not very efficient. I'm gonna put these discarded cards right here. Again, if you're actually playing the game on your own, keep them away from the tableau because I can guarantee you it gets really confusing about what you spent, what you discarded, and what should go back in the tableau. Just basically keep those off the left. For the purposes of this video, so you can actually see the cards I'm getting rid of and not get confused, I'm gonna show them sideways. So, walk is sitting there. We've got three cards left. I've got a walk and two focus. Well, still, the main goal is to get to the shed. We unfortunately don't have a search card yet in our hand to use to search the utility shed. That'll be something I'll go after, but let's go ahead. Now, the other thing we cannot forget to do is we cannot forget to reduce the time. That's a huge thing. So, if we go to walk right here, we did do the move up to one space, which we did, but right here it says time is going to decrease. So, we need to make sure to go to the time track and knock our time down by one. So that's a fairly simple thing to do. Six just drops down to five. So next we're gonna go ahead and try to do another walk. I'm gonna hope I'm a little more successful this time around. Let's roll the dice and see what happens. Oh, very, very successful. Now that would have been a much better thing to happen the first time around, but whatever, I'll take what I can get. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move into here. The good news with this, actually the bad news with this, is that even when I succeed greatly, I still lose time. It would have been nice to not have any time lost, but I still have to knock that time down by one. So I'm where I want to be, but I cannot search. The other thing to know that I didn't talk about in the overview is the fact that now I have two cards left in my hand. So you might be thinking, well, you know, do you always want to burn every single card you have in your hand? Great question. You may not, because there's other ways to use cards you have in your hand. If you decide during the action phase, you can discard cards, like these two if I didn't want to use them, in order to bump your time back up. Why would I do this? Well, if I discard these two focus cards in that pile, I can bump my time one up for each one, and what that does is it gives me more currency to use when I go to the tableau, which is the next phase in the spend phase to purchase cards for that upcoming round. So that's really important and it's a big time mechanic in the game. And if you don't do this, you're probably gonna run into situations where you don't have enough to buy the cards you really need. So you always gotta be thinking about a turn ahead, if not two turns ahead, because of that wonderful discard rule in terms of waiting an additional turn to see it in the tableau. So we got two focus cards, but also the temptation with these focus cards right now is to go ahead and actually use them to try to knock this horror level down. Getting this back to the green section would increase my chances of getting successes. Could be really good. So I think I might risk it. I think I might go ahead and roll, well, we'll try one focus here and try to see, because the good news is if I land it, I can actually end up gaining time back. So 
Only having one card in my hand, though, I have to realize the fact that I'm not going to be able to discard two cards to convert something to a success, so I'm strictly just relying on the dice right here, which is fairly risky. So we're going to go ahead and roll these two dice, hope for good things. Oh, okay, well, at least I got one success. I mean, it could have been better. I can't convert the uh, the two card symbol that I got here. And again, just so you know, this is actually marked on the die again. These are prototype dice. One success is going to be a remove, or I should say the horror track dropping down by one. So this drops to three. So we're getting there. And we do lose one time. Okay. Now I was currently at four because I was doing that example with you guys. So now I'm actually at three. All right. So we're going to go ahead and take the focus here. This is gone. Now I have to make a decision. Do I want to focus again or do I want to gain some time back? I think I want to gain some time back to use during the spend phase. So I'm going to go ahead and discard this card and bump my time back up by one. So we know the main goal now that we're at the utility shed is to search. So the search right here is gonna cost me two time and the good news is I have four going into this so I can pick up one of these and that's probably all I need to get that knife so long as I'm actually good at rolling. Uh, so we'll go ahead and knock my four down to a two. Now we need to figure out what the second card is gonna be or it could be technically taking two close calls. I have two time left to spend, so I could take both of these cards. It says play after any horror roll to re-roll any one die or you can re-roll all dice for two time. Hmm. Well, I'm noticing one thing here and that's the search card is not gonna give me any time back by being more successful. It will give me better options when searching, but it doesn't give me more time back. So that's not exactly what I wanna see. So I might go ahead and grab a sprint just so I can get on the move once I go ahead and dis well, once I hopefully I'm successful with my search. So that's a total of four that is going to consume all of what I had available. And now the actual time track is going to reset to six. And the next thing that's really important to do right after that is everything from my discard pile is going to now be available at the tableau. So all six of my free cards, I can just put them right here. So next time around, I can pick them up for free. So just so you guys can see where we're at in the flow of the different phases, we were in the spend phase, we can purchase action cards, we just did that. I went ahead and replenished all the cards that were discarded. That is not shown on this current prototype board, but it certainly is the time frame to do it so you don't forget. And then it says reset the time to six. So I went ahead after I'd spent all the time that I had, I was at four, I burnt all of it down to zero, and then you reset it back up to six. Now we're done the spend phase, we move into the killer phase. So the first thing we're going to do is perform the killer ability, which is right here up next to the K. You can see a knife. That symbol represents the killer attacking a single target in its space, dealing damage according to the killer's bloodlust level. Now, I did not reset my bloodlust level back up to the top where it should be after explaining all about bloodlust. So now knowing full well that it's at the very top, it's two. So it will be doing two worth of damage. Every single victim only has one health. So the second he gets into the same space as a victim, that victim is dead. Really, the damage that's being done here in terms of this track is really focused on what he's gonna do to the final girl if he gets the chance to attack, which is probably gonna happen. All the campers at Camp Happy Trails are really excited right now because the killer can't hit anybody. He's currently all alone up in the corner, but that is going to change because now we move to drawing a terror card. Well, this is actually kind of a shock because never before in any of my plays before filming this playthrough did I run into anything that was a positive from the terror deck, so I didn't realize there was any, actually. This one states right here, maybe things are starting to go our way. Draw the top card of any search deck. Huh. Interesting. Well, I guess I wasted my time going to the utility shed, seeing as I could have just taken it by standing still. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think I won't be going over and visiting the cabins anytime soon, seeing as the killer is over there currently, although I'd like to kind of jump through that secret tunnel at some point. So what I'm kind of leaning towards is the whistle. I really want the first aid kit too, because I could see that being super valuable, but I know I'm gonna wrap back around and come down to the dock here because I'm gonna be really trying to save some people at some point. So I think the one I won't be going to is the cabins, even though that tunnel exists between where I'm currently standing and the cabins. I'm gonna still wanna go after the knife and I still think the search card I got will be able to help me make that happen, I hope. Fingers crossed, although I am a little bit worried because I won't be able to convert any, oof. That's actually one other thing to think about. I won't be able to convert any dice because I only have two cards in my hand for my next upcoming action phase. So by going ahead and searching, I only have one extra card here to discard if I get one of those card symbols on the die. So that's not good. So I don't actually have a very high success rate in order to successfully search, I just need to get one success, but that's still risky with two dice. 
especially when I've only got a 33% chance roughly with each of them. That's not very good. So I could just take the knife to not waste time. There's that. Of course, if I fail the roll, then I'm stuck there waiting to get the knife later. Ugh, tough call. Very tough call. Uh, I, you know what? Maybe I'll take the knife and I'll use the search card to find out whatever is below that. We'll go with that so that I can guarantee I get the knife. So I'm going to go ahead, take that knife, and we're going to add it into my hand slot. So it's a one-handed weapon. It's going to sit right there. It's always good to have a weapon. And we're going to go ahead and discard this horror card. That is, or I should say terror card. That was a great pull. The last phase of this round is the upkeep phase. And sometimes there will be little or pretty much nothing you need to actually do in the upkeep phase. But basically, you're just trying to make sure you keep aware of any effects from events or other special rules that might require you to trigger something during this time frame or handle something during this window of time. If we run across that, we will do so. But other than that, we can move right back around to another round, starting with the action phase and the two cards that I have to use. Now, you'll probably notice that when I went ahead and I grabbed the item from the utility shed, I did not flip the item deck over. In other words, I didn't take the top card from the item deck and flip it up. You're not supposed to have advanced knowledge of the item deck beyond what you see from the beginning of the game. That is the only advantage you get is those cards are flipped up, one of them on top of each of those decks from the start. You'll have to actually use search cards and other ways within the game to dig deeper into those item decks and hope to find something worthwhile. So being that I have a search card and now I can actually search again I might as well so I'm going to go ahead and spend this card right here we're gonna roll some dice and see how well we do now remember I can't convert anything right now so even if I get those two card symbols I can't use them good thing I got one success which says take the top card of your location perfect and I lose one time so I was successful so the question becomes, what item are we going to get off the top of the deck? Let's see. It's always a surprise. Oh, look at this. Fireworks. That's kind of cool. Fireworks states, discard the fireworks during the action phase for two times. You're losing two time to do so. To place them in your space or on an adjacent space. You can't put them in the lake. That's pretty obvious. Whenever the killer must choose a target, they will choose the fireworks instead. Discard the fireworks when the killer enters a space where it is located. Ah, nice. So it's a diversion. So we'll We'll go ahead and take the fireworks card and we're going to place it in our backpack here because this again doesn't have a hand symbol so it doesn't take up anything and we can freely use that when we want. Again if I was to ever have say a two-handed weapon uh, and I have the knife equipped right now the two-handed weapon would have to sit in my backpack as well until I decided to change that out. So we have a card here that we just dealt with, which is a search card. And it stated that I lost one time after successfully searching. So this will drop down to a five. This card has now been used. So I'll just turn this sideways. The only one I have left is sprint. The question is, do I want to use it? Or do I want to bump myself from a five up to a six when I go into the next tableau? Ugh, tough call. Now, I really would like to actually try and save some victims, but I'd have to do really well on the rolling and be really fluky to land two successes to be able to move up to three spaces. So I'm likely going to only end up getting one success, which will allow me to move up to two spaces, which still isn't all that great. And of course, you don't have to discard cards for time. I can hold on to the cards in my hand. I have a hand limit of 10. So discarding them just gains me the advantage of bumping my time up. Uh, but I don't have to do that either. I'm actually going to decide to hold on to the sprint card and not discard it for additional time. I want to actually keep this and maybe purchase the other sprint card, combine them to be able to move a lot in the next round. So I've got five time to spend here. And these cards down in the bottom left-hand corner, remember, these ones are free. There's zero time. So I'm going to take all of these, which is fantastic. I'm going to add them with my sprint card that I didn't discard from before. So now I've got a total of seven cards in hand again my limit is 10. now i've got five time to spend what do i want to add into this pile well having another sprint would be good because i want to try to get all the way around the game board and try to save as many of those victims from the bonfire as humanly possible before he comes down there and starts slaughtering them all so let's go ahead with a sprint card that's going to be two i still have three left to spend what should I grab? I really like the idea of going after distraction with my three. Now I could have broke this up and grabbed other things, but distraction is actually not a bad one. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick this one up and 
That's actually really good, because if I happen to roll two successes, I can actually reduce my horror level by two, which will tick me down into the three dice zone, plus gain two time back. So that's a pretty good one. So let's purchase that. So that cost me my last three all the way down to zero. And as it mentions right here at the spend phase, now we reset right back up to six. Then we're gonna go ahead and take all discarded cards, which is search, and we're gonna put them in the tableau for later. Moving on to the killer phase. The killer's gonna try to attack someone in his own space. There is nobody, thank goodness. We're gonna go to a terror card next. Uh-oh, this is not good. We've got ourselves. he just keeps coming. And you can see this face right here. That means this horror level is going up. That's not good. So basically the card I just picked up to hopefully bring us into the three dice zone. Uh, I'm gonna have to potentially use some focus cards as well as distraction to get us all the way down there now. That's no good. Next up, it states this icon right here, which shows not only a victim, but the final girl as well. So he's gonna move towards whichever one is closer. So we gotta determine the target first. So who's closest? Well, closest right now, make out point, the only uh, point of access to that is through this way. So there's no way that's the closest. Uh, I'm not close, but this guy right here, or girl, this killer could move right along this path one and here for this victim here. Now the campsite down below here, the fire pit I should say, is connected only through where the killer currently sits and a path down or through one of these other two paths on the opposite side. So he is definitely going to move shortest path to get to either the final girl or victim. So he's found now a victim and unfortunately he is going to stab and kill or slash up that victim, killing him. So that dead victim is going to go into this pile right here. And then we're gonna go ahead and bump up the bloodlust. So his track is on the move and you can see the next time he kills somebody, the terror level or the horror level is going to increase again. So it's a good thing that I'm planning to do quite a bit during this turn because first off, I need to get some control over my horror level because that is going to go way up. So what I'm gonna do is we'll determine how well these focus and distractions uh, work out. Well, let's try, hmm, can I focus, if I focus once and then focus again, if I got super lucky, I might be able to get it to, that would be two. So the best case scenario with both focus cards, I could get it to here. I was hoping to be able to tick into this area. Uh, it's not gonna work. So distraction I could use. Yeah, I think distraction is the one I'm gonna have to use. Plus I gained two time back. That's actually pretty good. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and use uh, distraction here. We're gonna roll. Plus I have the ability to discard cards finally because I have so many in my hand. So we're gonna roll here, hope for good things. Yikes, okay, that was not the best roll ever. So I could discard two cards. So I could discard the cards that I know I have, which are not that great anyway, just to get one success. I do gain time back though. That's pretty good, even with just a single success. So that's not bad, so let's do it. Let's do a weak attack and short rest. I'm not planning on doing either of those this turn, so those are the ones I'm gonna discard. And that is gonna convert this one here to success. So we now can go down the track one, which is good. And time-wise, I'm going up to seven, good. This card here now can be discarded as well. Okay, I think it's time to sprint. We don't have much time to spare here. The killer is right next to a whole bunch of victims near the bonfire. We need to use our fireworks to try and distract him and hopefully save as many of these victims as we possibly can. So let's go ahead and sprint and hope for the best here. So we're gonna play this card. We're hoping for two successes. Big time crossing of the fingers. Okay, we got a success and two cards to discard. Now, a success will give us two movement, which is pretty good already, or we could discard two cards to gain one additional move. Now, a regular walk can give you one move for success or two for two successes, so I don't think it's worth it in this case. Uh, I could be wrong there. I won't know until later, but we'll go ahead and move two. So we're gonna go one, two. I already have the one success to pay for that. I lose one time, so I'll go from seven down to six. Now it's gonna resolve that card, that will go into the discard. I'm making my way around, hopefully gonna make it. Uh, we'll do another sprint. Remember my plan was to do two of these in the same round. Oh, that's bad. So we got ourselves a discard and a blank. That's not good. Ah, shoot. So if I convert that, I get two movements, which would get me, I could actually get from here to here. So that's not bad, because then I could put the fireworks here and if I was gonna, yeah, let's actually do it. So let's discard a, let's discard the two focus cards to turn that into a success. Uh, that's gonna knock our time down by one. We're allowed to move two spaces. I'm gonna go one and two. So now this victim is with me. It says, oh, I guess this is the other thing too that's kind of a kicker. 
So now we're gonna go ahead and discard the fireworks during the action phase for two time, a loss of two time, very important. So we're gonna drop from a five down to a three and place this in our current position. So I'll just go ahead and use this marker to represent the fireworks being placed here, which is great. It'll be a wonderful distraction for the killer. So we fully resolved the sprint card. This will be discarded and now we need to make a choice. I have two cards left in my hand. I have two walk cards. This is really tough. I, uh, I could technically just one space and I can get this victim off the game board, which would be huge. That would also allow me to gain two time back, for instance, from one of the victim slots on Selena's card, which could be quite handy. So this is my plan of action here. And I don't even know if this is the best course of action, but I have two walk cards left here. So what I'm thinking of doing is leaving the victim that's currently in this spot where that victim is because we're only one space away from an exit location where I can get that victim out. So what I wanna do is get into this bonfire area or fire pit area and get two of them and bring them out to join that other victim. When the killer comes into the same space as us where the fireworks are, it's gonna be interesting for sure. This may not work. I can tell you that right now because I might have put myself into a pretty tight situation. But we're gonna try to see if we can make it work. So first off, we're gonna walk. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna roll two dice. Really hoping I land two successes here. Okay, one, well, it's better than nothing. So we do lose a time, so I'm gonna drop from three down to two. And I'm, I am able at this point to walk into this fire pit. So now I'm going to take two individuals with me as I attempt, and I guess I shouldn't take them until I actually move out. So we'll go ahead and just wait a second here until I actually attempt to use my last walk. We've already paid the time for this one, so this is discarded. I'm down to my last card. I did not expect to be spending all of my cards, but I really need to get them on the move here. We're gonna roll again. Come on, let me see two spaces. That would be huge. Oh, we got it. We got two successes. That was complete fluke. So, wow. All right. So with the two, we do lose at times. So we're down to one. Wow. We're not going to have much uh, in terms of spending power in the next one. That's going to be really bad. Um, so this is something that actually comes back to haunt you as well as part of the game mechanics for trying to push and do as much as possible in one turn. So we got a two, that means I can move up to two spaces. So I'm going to take two of my uh, victims here and I'm going to run with them through here and then to here and we go out the door. Now, here's where the benefit comes to doing this, and it actually works out perfect in relation to time. As you can see on Selena's card, she's got two slots here that represent an increase of two on the time track. Well, at a time where I don't have very much time to go into the spend phase, probably a good idea to gain some time back so we can actually do something next turn. So this works out perfectly. Not only do we save some victims from the bonfire, but we're gonna increase our time from one up to five. Just like that, we're back in business. At this point, I've used all the cards that I had available to me, so all of them are in the discard pile. They won't be coming back to me uh, for this current spend phase upcoming, but I do have five to spend, which is pretty good. Now we move into the spend phase where I have five to spend, and this is where I need to think about maybe reaction cards like Retaliate or Guard. They both have a blue hue to them. The reason for that is when wounds are coming your way or you're being hit for health hearts, you're definitely gonna wanna have some cards in your hand that are able to do either some canceling of that damage or even retaliating against maybe even canceling a combination would be pretty awesome. So you can see if I get two successes with Retaliate, I can cancel all damage coming to me plus hit back for two. Not bad. So I'm gonna go ahead and pay for Retaliate. And remember, I don't have to use this. I can just hold it in my hand. As long as I'm not over my 10 card limit, I can keep this for the moment when I really truly need it. Now I only have one left to spend, so I might as well go ahead and grab Close Call because this will allow me to roll or re-roll one die from my Horror Roll, which could help me get the successes I need or re-roll all the dice to burn some time. Now, one thing you'll notice now that I've replenished the tableau is the fact that I had all my sprint and walk cards, which is all my movement at the same time in the same round of play. I use them all as well. That's the key piece of information there. If you use all of your movement in a current round of actions, then the issue becomes the next time you're up for a round of actions, which is coming up in the near future for me, I'm gonna have zero movement. Hence the reason I grab retaliate in case something crazy happens. To end off the spend phase, we're gonna reset ourselves back to six and we're going to the killer phase now where he's gonna to try to kill someone in his space. Nobody is there, thank goodness, so that's not gonna happen. We're going right to the terror deck to see what he's got coming at us next. 
Uh-oh, this does not look good. He wants fresh blood. If there are no victims on the board, discard and draw the next tarot card. Well, there definitely are victims on the board. Otherwise, he's going to target victims. And, of course, he's going to move when he has a choice between a space with one victim or an another pile of victims. In this case, there's four of them to go to the one with more victims first. However, we have fireworks down. And whenever he's acquiring a target, which is this symbol in the yellow right here, regardless of the icon in terms of whether you see the final girl there or a victim. The fireworks here are his main attraction right now. These are basically going off because we set them there. So he's going to move here instead and the great news is he's not going to go ahead and do anything further. It says discard the fireworks when the killer enters the space where it is located. And here's where things get a little bit funny actually and kind of sad at the same time is I really set that victim up to die because what I didn't realize with the fireworks is it doesn't prevent the killer from actually killing someone in that space. So this is pretty bad. I basically planted fireworks in a spot with a victim, ran away, grabbed two other people, ran past that victim, saved two other people, and enjoyed that moment while now watching the victim I passed by get cut to shreds. So I don't know what kind of person I am or what kind of cruel situation I just put this current victim through, but this is probably up there for one of the worst. But yes, the killer is gonna go ahead now and actually slice and dice up this victim, which is really unfortunate. So mistakes were certainly made there. Would have been smarter to go into that space, grab that victim, bring that victim into the bonfire space, leave that victim there, pick up two victims, or even just keep the one I already had, and move back across. Instead, what I did was I left that victim there to die, essentially, in the most cruel way imaginable. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead here and put this victim into the dead area. I've learned from that mistake. And hey, you know what? Horror movies, sometimes you do really dumb things. So in this case, what's going to happen is nothing's going to change stat-wise, but we did hit a new terror level. So this is going to increase up to four, which is unfortunate for us. There's nothing for us to do in the upkeep phase. We wrap right around to the action phase. And ironically, this is the first time I'll be doing nothing at all during the action phase because I have two cards that I don't want to use. I could potentially discard them to gain more time to allow me in the spend phase to purchase more cards. But I want these because there is a chance, being that we're literally only a space away from the killer, that on the killer phase, he could come into our space. Uh, so this is the interesting part is currently based on targeting rules. If the target comes up to be the final final girl and the victims and he has to choose between them and we're equal distance like we are right now with the fire pit and us on this side over here then he'll go towards the area that has the most victims that's including the final girl in that mess as well final girl is only representative of one there's currently four at the bonfire so he would go to the bonfire the only way that the killer will come to me directly is if the target symbol shows the final girl then he's coming straight for me and that retaliate card is definitely worth holding on to in my hand in case he does does. So we have learned quite a few great things here. And the first thing we've learned is never to purchase all the sprint and walk cards in the exact same round because it caps you in terms of where you can go and what you can do. So what I'm gonna do is I still want to try and save in an upcoming round as many people from the bonfire as possible. So sprint really is a high priority being that I'm only two spaces away from the bonfire and I can walk through an area that has the killer. The only thing that's going to be a problem is if I'm bringing victims back through the killer, they will not enter his space. So I would have to find another location or exit, I should say, to drop them off at. I, I wouldn't be able to bring them through the killer space. They're not that dumb. Whereas the final girl is very brave and will go straight through the space, the victims are not gonna follow me in. So long story short, I wanna buy two sprint cards. I'm gonna leave the walk cards, the freebie ones, in for another turn later on down the road, but I will take all the rest. So the walk cards are gonna stay here. The two sprint that I just bought cost me four. So I currently have two left over to spend. I have to decide what else I wanna grab. You know what, grabbing a close call would make a lot of sense. The only downside with grabbing this close call is the fact there's nothing else I can spend my last time on. And I don't wanna take uh, any of the walk cards. Actually, let me make sure I put them both down. Are they both there? Yes, they are both there. So I think I'll stop right there. We just, we just won't spend that final time that I had. So now at this point, we're going to reset back up to six. And again, because I didn't discard any cards from the action phase, I have a total hand size of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, which is the highest I've had, I believe. 
So this is where things get fun. We got to find out what the killer is going to do here. So the killer is going to try to kill someone in his space. There is nobody there. It's going to go to the terror deck and find out what happens. Oh, interesting. So it says he kept swinging his hammer and killing and killing. Now, based on this card, you can see the target is going to be victims, not me. So that retaliate card didn't come into play here. But guess what? It's going to be a major problem. The fact he's going into that fire pit location and he's going to have a field day. So first off, he's going to target that location as it has the most victims in the area. And it's the only other area that has victims. So he's going right in there. Then he's going to kill one of them. And then he's going to try to find a target again, which happened to be right in his space. He will stay still and he'll kill a second victim. So two are going down. So our killer is getting pretty brazen with his kills at this point. So he's going to go ahead and move into this space right here. He's going to go ahead and kill one of the victims here. So we're going to go ahead and take this victim, throw them in the dead pool. We're also going to raise up Bloodlust by one. And we're certainly not done yet because as you saw on the bottom of that card, there's another attack. He's going to target another victim in that space. You might think at this point, this is when the panic mechanic in the game is going to trigger. It does not. It triggers after all the attacks in the card have been resolved. So once everything's been resolved, then if there's other victims in the space after he has slaughtered somebody, they are going to run away. And we'll talk about how that works in a second. So he's now going to go ahead and target another victim from this bonfire, killing them as well. And of course, is going to increase his bloodlust. And as you can see, it's going to tick him into another level. So now he's going to be hitting Final Girl when he gets the chance at three pretty high still only moving once every single time he moves but that could really start jumping up later on and then down here we're going to see because of this masquerade here the horror level is going to go up by one so that's also pretty vicious so now that the number of victims in that space has come drastically down thanks to the killer slicing them all into pieces we don't really need to use this token to mention anything to do with a large group of people because well there isn't any anymore but these two individuals now that his killing is over with are terrified and they are going to panic you'll see on the sides of this particular fire pit there are numbers we're going to go ahead and roll a die for each of the victims in this space. If they land a 2 through to a 5, it's going to move them out this way to the right. And if we land a 6, it's going to move them straight up and out. If they land a 1, they're going to just pretend that they're safe by hiding somewhere around the fire pit. Now, I'm really hoping it's between a 2 and a 5 for these ones because that brings them closer to me so I can save them. That's what I'd like to see. Hopefully, they're not dumb enough to run further away from me. Okay, first one is a 5. Wow, that was close. So this one is going to move over here. So we're good there. Next one, a 3. We're good there. So they both actually move closer to me, which is perfect. So what I'll be able to do in a upcoming... Uh, action phase here is attempt to get both of those individuals out of here and we just so happen to be moving into the action phase a brand new round now i've noticed that my horror level is getting really high up thanks to all the killing that hans is doing so selena is getting quite worried but i do have these wonderful distraction cards that i can go after later on to try to bring that down hopefully with good successes there for now i want to focus on saving some victims before they get slaughtered these ones are running right towards me looking for help so i'm going to go ahead and use sprint because this is the best case scenario for movement so let's go ahead and roll off i'm hoping for just a single success that will save them yes okay we got it we don't have to burn any additional cards that's perfect we are going to go ahead and drop time down so it's going to go down to five we can move up to two spaces so i'm going to move into this space with them and then i'm going to move them back over here getting them out safely now i can place these victims on selena's card well, I know what I want to do with my victims that I've saved. One of them is going to be placed on the movement of one space. So I'll be able to move right now. And I'm going to move towards the docks because I want to be there to be able to potentially pick up the first aid kit later on with a search card. Maybe next turn at the beginning of next turn. And I'm also going to do a plus two terror cards. So that is going to allow me to add two terror cards to the deck from the one that's sitting off to the side of my current setup that has the location cards and the killer cards all mixed together, bringing two new terror cards in means the finale is delayed a little bit longer. I have now shuffled two new terror cards into the deck. I'm also going to move Selena along the path here to the docks. So my sprint card has been fully resolved from before. 
that's going to go away. We went ahead, we were able to bring those individuals out. We paid the one time for it. We were able to save the two victims, put them on Selena's card, gain some movement as well as two terror cards into the deck. I think that's honestly all I want to do this time because I'm not ready yet to dive into the space with the killer and go crazy. Although I do have retaliate, I'd like to go after critical blow. So I don't want to spend too much more of my time. I'd like to actually increase my time to be able to buy better cards going into the next round. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to discard short rest because I don't plan to be short resting anytime along the way and weak attack because well weak attack is pretty bad. So both of these cards are going to discard both of them to increase my time to seven. I am tempted to do more than that. Uh, I do have two close calls in my hand to retaliate, a sprint, a focus, and a focus. So the sprint for sure I want to keep because that will be able to get me to his location, which sorry, he's been he was moved, but he was been sitting in the fire pit. Uh, shoot, so what do I do with the focuses? Do I need them both? Kind of, uh, although I could go after a distraction, which might be, actually, you know what? That might be better. Let's get rid of both of the focus cards to go after a distraction instead, because no, not only the fact that we get to take away from the horror track, we also gain some time if we're successful. So let's go ahead and ditch both focuses, which is going to be two more time. So that will jump us up to nine. So now we'll definitely be able to get the critical blow card that's six, and we'll definitely be able to get a distraction card, which is three. So that will help mitigate the horror. We'll get the critical blow. So when we get in there, we can do a really big hit to him. Plus we could stay in there and I can use my retaliate card later on. If he hits me, I can cancel all the damage as a reactionary card and hit him back. Of course, I have to land two successes, but that's why I'd want to hold these cards in my hand. Close call so I can reroll things as I need to. Plus, I got Sprint. So literally these four cards are perfect with the amount of uh, time that I currently have stored up going into this next spend phase. So I'm gonna stop right here and we're gonna dive into picking up the cards I just talked about. You know what, we're gonna go for it. I'm actually gonna discard my Sprint card. I wasn't planning on doing this, but being that there's two walk cards in here and I'm only two distance away from this killer, I'm gonna go ahead to get rid of the sprint card to change up my plan here. So what I'm doing at this point by discarding the sprint is instead of nine, I'm ticking myself up to 10 going into the spend phase. What's really cool is now I can afford the big time card I was talking about before. I could have afforded this last time with nine too. This one here is awesome. It will do for two successes, it'll do three damage and lower horror or for one success, two damage, lower horror and end my action. So I wanna do this at the very end of course, but this is a great card. So I'm definitely gonna grab this one. That's six from 10 down to four. And then what I'm gonna do is go after Furious Strike instead of Distraction. Because as you can see, if I do really well on these rolls, I can still drop my horror down. Uh, now I really have to do really well on Furious Strike to not have my action end. So that's the risk. But I'm going to have these close call cards in my hand to use to hope that I can re-roll to get the two successes each time. It's a big time risk though, but I'm hoping to kind of get in there and do as much damage as humanly possible. So we're going to go ahead and grab this one right here. That is going to take up my entire 10. And at this point, I'm done spending. However, I do want to take the two walk cards, which are free. It would be unwise of me not to do that. I wouldn't even be able to put my plan together without them. So three, four, five, six, seven cards total. Now the cards that I had discarded are going to replenish into the tableau. Let's move into the final killer phase of this video. We're going to go ahead and perform his killer ability, which thankfully there's nobody left in the fire pit for him to go after. And the really good thing is the other victims way over here, the only entrance into the makeup point is through a lake which you'd have to come through the dock or go all the way around the outside through this area over here so they're pretty secluded for now and I'm between them more so than anything else so I should be able to save them if I need to the great thing is the two victims that are left are the exact amount that I need in order to flip Selena over in order to get her special ability so it is going to be something I'm going to focus on and I'll probably be willing to save them the second that he starts to focus on them which could even happen during this phase so right now he does his stab inside of the fire pit. No one is there. We skip past that. We go to the terror deck and see what we find. Hans wants me. He's always wanted me. It targets the final girl, which is... Oh no, look at this. So he's only got one movement currently right now. But because he got two boots, he's going to be moving one and then another one. Basically, he activates his boot ability however many times is on the card. So he's in my space right now. 
This is pretty wild. He's going to go ahead and he's going to attack me. Now, thank goodness I kept the retaliate card. So by keeping this retaliate card right now, I can play this as a reactionary card in order to roll to get two successes to hopefully cancel all the damage and do damage back to him. So cross your fingers because this could go south. <laughs> but I do have some reroll ability here. All right, so we got ourselves two card discard for a success and a blank. That's a really bad roll overall. What I could do, and what I haven't done yet, as, as you can see here, is I should have reset this back to six after the spend. I could actually go ahead and play close call. I can either reroll any one die, or I could reroll all dice for two time. That's a really tough decision. Really tough. Um, I don't want to waste time. But this roll's really bad, and uh, it would be nice to get a success right off the bat. But it's not guaranteed. Shoot, this is a tough one. I'm going to go ahead. Now, here's the question. If I was to go ahead and convert one of those successes with my two walks, say, for instance, because I don't have any need for them, seeing as he's in my space, although that would prevent me from leaving his space, which would open me up big time to attacks later on, which would also not be good. Yikes. You know what? I might just have to do it. I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to take the two-time hit in order to re-roll both dice. I don't like it. So we're going to go ahead and discard. Close call. Take this. Roll it off. Give me something better. There we go. That's a pretty close to exactly what I was hoping to see. So now what we can do is I can go ahead and say, you know what? I'm in a better place now. Uh, I want to keep one walk card to be able to get away from him. And I want to keep my critical blow and furious strike so I can do some big-time damage to him. Burnt all my close calls to do it though, which is unfortunate. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I'm gonna play walk and close call, discarding both of these to convert this to a success. Cancels all the damage coming at me, which would have been three. And he gets hit for two. Nice try, Hans, and not gonna happen yet. Selena is tougher than you think. But that's not all for Hans. He's actually gonna be inflicted by another hit of damage. And how do you ask? Well, I see a knife equipped by Selena currently. And when I went ahead and retaliated, anytime you see a symbol like this, you're making an attack and inflicting damage. You can add anything you have that can modify or enhance that attack and add additional damage in. So doing two off the retaliate with two successes was great. But now I can also add in the knife, which I have equipped. And equipped is the key thing there. It has to be equipped so i actually end up doing three damage to hans and that's going to end off the killer phase as well as the upkeep phase this is where we're going to stop for part number one join me in part number two to see whether or not we can stay on top of things selena currently got the very first cut on hans is really hoping to continue that to the point where we can take hans down hans has not hit us yet but he's running out of victims and we're definitely going to be a target for him coming up so we're going to have to prepare for attacks maybe guard cards will be useful we also have critical blow here in furious strike which i'm hoping to use later on we have options at our disposal we could simply focus on just trying to take him down but it's not going to be easy so hopefully i'll see you in the next video thank you guys so much for watching hopefully this will help you make an informed decision on the kickstarter and as always keep on rolling solo